Welcome back. We've made it through almost two weeks of class. That's something. Congratulations. We're all still here. Um, so let's see, some logistics. One, there is a, uh, this blog post from GitHub came out yesterday and I thought it was fascinating. Uh, in general, it's fascinating because it talks about this you know, cool new AI that everybody's obsessed about these days, but also because it fits really well with the topic of our class uh, on Tuesday, which kind of you know, talked about essentially an AI system just like this and how you might go about evaluating it. Uh, so I thought it was a really great um, opportunity to reflect a bit on what they've done as well uh, at GitHub. So there's a discussion post asking you to think about the blog post that they published yesterday uh, and you know, critique it in some technical depth in terms of the study design. Right. They don't give out too many details in the blog posts, um, and they promise, I've read it, they promise to have a more you know, academic paper that follows this with more details and whatnot. So I, you know, I, I get all this, but you know, do your best with the information you have and think about um, uh, what, if anything, is missing in terms of the evaluation or, or things like this, strengths and weaknesses. Uh, I, I, was, yeah, I was very uh, excited to see that and read that. Okay, the other thing, I sent out a description of the final projects. Uh, so you know, hopefully you've seen that and you're thinking about it. Uh, I encourage you to talk to us, to me and Bobo about your ideas, you know, as early as you have them. You don't have to wait until the kickoff presentations uh, to do that um, so that we can you know, help you at least confirm that they make sense uh, and point you in a different direction if needed. So, you know, please start thinking about that and talk to us. Let's see. Uh, oh, the other thing, there is a first ever homework assignment. Um, the discussion posts and whatnot are gonna count towards participation. And I'm, I'm hoping that you won't spend too much time on them. Um, there's an actual homework assignment that I posted, should be visible today, hopefully, you know, let me know if you don't see this. Sometimes Canvas is weird. Thank you, Courtney, for helping me debug this the other week. Um, it's a lit review assignment for end of next week. Um, and if that's not reasonable, let me know. But I think I think that should be sufficient time uh, for this. I, I see the, the homework. You see the homework in Canvas. Yeah. Okay, very good. Uh, all right. So for did it see any questions on anything? class or homework related or project related or otherwise. Okay, so for today, what I was hoping to do is teach you a great cool trick that I think will probably serve you for most if not all of the papers you'll be writing from now on. Um, it's a really you know, easy to grasp, I think, trick and really useful. Um, and you know, I, I'm hoping you will uh, agree with this by the end. So we're gonna talk about literature reviews today um, and you know, kind of why and how we do them and how they fit into the whole process. Um, and we're gonna dissect a couple of examples of literature reviews. So you should have access to the class website. And I have posted, where's my mouse? There is no mouse. I have posted the links to the two papers on the class website. So, you know, you'll hopefully uh, open some device at some point in a few minutes, uh, and we will be able to access these from the class website. And if not, I don't know, I can post also this again in the Zoom chat for Kush. Let's see. Uh, if I can find it. All right. So moving back. Okay. So 
yeah, this is this is what you're hopefully going to look at for more details after class. This is where the content from the lecture is coming from from these readings. Okay, so why why literature reviews and where do, where does this come in? Well, you know, obviously, when you choose a research project, like the you know the absolute minimum that you need is for you to be able to study whatever topic you're planning on studying, right? But that doesn't really narrow things too much. There are lots of things that one could study. You know, certainly you need to be able to study whatever it is you're studying or planning on studying, uh, but that doesn't quite narrow it enough. So the question that hopefully you'll be asking yourselves is not just whether you can study something, but rather whether you should study something. Uh, and who cares, you know, who cares if you do uh, besides yourselves? Like, obviously you care, right? Because you know, you're considering studying whatever you're studying, uh, but you know, hopefully more than just yourselves, uh, more people than just yourselves will care about that topic and will find the results of your study interesting. So um, that's kind of the idea here uh, that you know, it's good to reflect on how whatever you're doing fits into this greater body of knowledge. Um, okay, so when you the the way you establish this, the way you determine uh, that something is worth studying in addition to something is possible to study, um, and also the way you convince reviewers of your papers of the same thing, is through a literature review. Like often uh, in our when I say our, I mean in software engineering, which is a very technical field, often people. Um, don't put too much thought into literature reviews. Uh, in fact, if you look at the structure of software engineering research papers, often you will see that this discussion of related work, the literature, is something that comes at the very end before the conclusion section. So, you know, after you have done and presented everything that you have done and presented, um, it's, it feels, right, it feels, if you think about it, like an afterthought. It's just something that you put at the very end because maybe, I don't know, reviewers expected or because your advisor asked you to or you know, something like this, but not because it actually serves any useful, meaningful purpose and you've put a lot of thought into, you know, why it's there, right? Uh, I'm sure you've seen lots of examples of papers where related work is this section stapled more or less at the end of a paper. So, um, there, you know, there are certainly uh, valid situations um, for, for that. And you know, there's no one single right structure for a paper and the wrong structure for papers. But that aside, um, I want you to think a little bit more deeply about kind of where this comes in, uh, where, where this related work section and this literature review comes in and, and why it's there. Um, so the, you're doing this uh, at the very least to summarize to readers what is known about a particular topic uh, and you know, summarize the results from really the studies and whatnot. Uh, often, if you're building a new algorithm or tool or whatever to do something, um, this discussion, the summary of what people have done before you, hopefully on the same topic, is useful also for benchmarking and comparison purposes. You know, you wanna know kind of what the state of the art on some problem is so that you can uh, place your work uh, in, in that context. Uh, so that's all fine. Um, but really the main purpose of this discussion of related work of this literature review is not to report on what is already known, but rather to identify what remains unknown. That is the key. Um, so the idea is that you know you want to relate your study to this existing body of knowledge, and you want to argue through this discussion of related work uh, and the literature that there is some gap in uh, prior knowledge, and that your work addresses it in some meaningful way. So that's really the key. Um, and this is useful because it you know, helps you frame and derive your research questions or hypotheses or what have you, uh, acts as a sort of framework that establishes the importance of your study, maybe guides the design and whatnot. 
Um, okay, so there's several ways in which people do lit reviews. You know, you can integrate what others have said and done. That's one way. You can have the purpose of this lit review uh, be to criticize what people have done before you, you know, politely. Um, it's another way. You sometimes write these lit reviews to build bridges between related topics. If you remember, for example, I think both papers were discussed last time. Um, certainly, well, so we had the impulse buying and we had, what was the other thing? The Facebook relationship, so people creating uh, whatever links to each other on Facebook. Uh, remember how, for example, the Facebook paper drew on these three different theories we, you know we talked about you know how how is this how does this work you know there's not one theory but three and where do they all fit in and we talked about how they maybe describe different aspects of this phenomenon and they you know explain different parts of it and they also fit together um, so you know that's an example of how the authors were maybe building a bridge between these different uh, theories and applying that to their particular study um, you know, or you could do a lit review to identify uh, what are the main topics that people have been working on in a particular field, uh, and kind of what's the general state of knowledge, and uh, what are the big, important, open questions still remaining. Um, as a side effect, a lit review forces you to articulate your contributions. This is always useful. Reviewers always look for this. Um, sometimes explicitly, I often see uh, typically introductions to research papers ending with a summary of the contributions of that work of that paper. Uh, and those contributions are, you know, with respect to the state of knowledge as uh, summarized in your lit review. So, you know, do, does your project address a new topic? Does it use a new uh, algorithm or data collection method or whatever new technique? Does it extend some discussion of some previously known phenomenon? Does it refine or extend some theory? Does it replicate something that was known uh, elsewhere in a new context? You know, whatever it might be, but it forces you to articulate what these contributions are. Um, okay, so I let's let's dissect a couple of examples, uh, and we'll come back. So we'll spend a few minutes reading these. Um, we'll come back, and we will see what these two papers have in common in terms of how they structure this discussion of uh, related work and the literature. So um, what I'd like you to do, please, is to um, look at each of these two papers. We'll start with, uh, we'll start with a two case studies paper um, and um, read, so, right. In the two case studies paper, uh, again, these are all linked on the uh, on the website. Read just the uh, introduction and uh, so read up to methodology and data sources. Basically, these three and a half pages or two and a half pages at the beginning. Okay, this makes sense. Um, and think about these two questions. Think about how much prior work was there? How this literature was literature review is organized? What kinds of questions the paper is addressing? Uh, and what is the knowledge gap in this collective knowledge that the paper tries to fill? Right, so I want you to try to identify these components and answers to these questions as you're reading. So let's just take a few minutes, I don't know, five minutes to um, to go through this first paper, or however long it takes to read these uh, couple of pages. Okay, does, does somebody need a device or do you all have access to something you can read on? Okay, looks like yes. I'm going to pause the recording and resume it in a couple of minutes. All right, let's talk about this for a minute. What what does this look like? What does it feel like? How is this structured? What's the yeah? What's the structure of this discussion and this paper? 
And what's the argument? What's the structure of the argument the authors are making? Uh, it seems like there are very clearly observable characteristics of open source software that are based on the specific um, studies they are citing as well as particularly case studies like that are just ob ob observable in the, the world, but it's less clear as to why these characteristics are as they are. Um, and they're looking more for the motivation behind like the ways to do it. What, so let me, yes, I agree with everything you said, but what is, what is say the prior knowledge in this area uh, and what, what, if any, is the gap in the knowledge? Can anybody help me summarize this? Yes, you. So, okay, so part of, all right, let, let me just summarize this for people on Zoom in case the audio is off. Uh, the answer in the room was, there's a lot of knowledge, prior knowledge about commercial software development, but not too much knowledge about open source software development. So I agree with this, but that seems only a part of the story. What, what else is missing? Let's see, uh, look. I think uh, further on top of that, um, the style of development that's done in open source, that, that's typical of open source development, um, is sort of contrary to what the current literature considers as um, necessary and beneficial uh, for software development. So for corporate software development, there's more documentation, there's more, um, uh, there are more structures that uh, Plan and uh, help uh, different team members cooperate, and there's very little formal structure for open source software development. Yet it seems to work because there is this user problem. So there's sort of these paradoxes. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. So the the comment was the it's not that we know a lot about, or not just that we know a lot about commercial software development, and not a lot about open source software development. But also that you know, there's maybe good reasons or lots of evidence that open source software development is somehow fundamentally different from commercial software development. So, so that I agree, that's a great point. Anything else? Did you have something? Yeah, I'm mean, very familiar with what you said. I think the way that so far, like the motivation is structured is they start off with like a list of bullet points on how they would describe open source development, which all of them seem like pretty much broad acts of development. Like, is there any, you know, there's no explicit design, there, there's no product plan or schedule, which are things that seem like you would need for good development. Uh -huh. And then they use the literature after that to say, but we are seeing these many examples of open source actually being beneficial. Um, and so using that sort of contrast with how it is and all of that. Yep, 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 yep. That's it. So th that's exactly it. The comment is, you know, uh, so it's not just that we don't know a lot about open source and that open source seems to be fundamentally different from commercial software development, but also it seems to work at least as well, right? So it, it's fundamentally different, yet it seems to work just as well and nobody has any idea why, like how is this possible? Because it seems to lack so many of the things that the literature has, uh, I don't know, concluded are essential for successful software development, right? So how can this new thing be also successful or as successful or more successful, whatever, I don't know, while lacking all of these critical ingredients for success, like how is that possible? Okay, um, so the, the, I think they do a really good job at, at articulating this gap. Uh, 
So here, let me walk through some of these examples. All right, so these are quotes from the paper, which I thought kind of summarize the argument really well. Open source is often characterized as a fundamentally new way to develop software. Okay, so it's very different. Um, right, the process is radically different from the usual industrial style of development. Okay? Uh, and, and a bunch of ways that they enumerate. Okay? Uh, and then, you know, what is perhaps most surprising about the process is that it lacks many of the traditional mechanisms used to coordinate software development, such as plans, design schedules, et cetera, et cetera. These coordination mechanisms are generally considered to be even more important for geographically distributed development than for co-located development. So, okay, so it's not just that they're important in general and they're missing in this context, but they're actually you know, even more important in a context like this, and you know, still they're missing. And, um, and despite the very substantial weakening of traditional ways of coordinating work, the results from open source software development are often claimed to be equivalent or even superior to software developed more traditionally, right? So that's the puzzle, right? So, you know, it's very different, nothing makes sense, yet it somehow seems to work at least as well, right? So it, it gets you hooked. You're like, well, how can this be? How can this be? You know, how can it possibly work? Like, what, why does it do this? Like, you know, none of the things that we expected uh, you know, to, to matter are present, yet it works just as well. You know, how can this possibly be, right? Um, and, you know, so not only do they get you with this, uh, right, so then, you know, they argue that, right, if, if open source really does pose a major challenge to the economics uh, and the methods of commercial development, it is vital to understand that you, so, sorry, uh, oops. So, so that's the, you know, that's the hook, right? So no, there's a gap, but there's also this, you know, like what, who cares, right? So let's say, you know, there's this gap. So it's really interesting. I think they've established that, right? You know, it's very puzzling. Nobody understands why this is working. They've made a really good argument, but also they end that argument by saying, you know, Here's you know who would care about knowing this, knowing the answer to this. So it's not just of this you know intellectual exercise, but also it has these like tangible, actionable effects on you know the world, and uh, you know it's, it's poses a major challenge to the economics and the methods of commercial development. Right, so it sort of impacts so many things. Like it's really important that we understand how this works because it has such a huge impact on on the world, okay? So they, you know, again, like look back, they start with the summary of you know, what we know and about open source and how it's different from you know, commercial development in these ways that are known to be very important, yet open source seems to be very successful. You know, how can that be? How can that be? Okay? So this is, I think, a really good, you know, very concise, right? It took just a couple of pages in this loose format, very concise, arguably, and a really good, really clear argument for why this paper needs to exist. Okay. So let's look at another one. Uh, so we're going to do the second one with the Zoom folks. Okay. So get uh, get ready. So let's look at the second paper, the short and tweet paper. Uh, and let's do the same thing. Let's spend a few minutes reading the introduction or right, the introduction and the related work section of this paper. So the sections that I highlight here, the first two and a half pages. Uh, and let's come back and reflect on how they built the, what the argument is and how they build it. Let's see who is brave enough to summarize this, uh, I guess, what's the paper about and what's the argument the authors are making here in the beginning of the paper? Somebody over Zoom. 
Courtney has her hand up. Sure. Uh, yeah, I was going to say they talk about how there's lots of different kind of ways to get information to consumers and that on the social medias, they are like overwhelmed with information. And then there's this, um, you know, new cool thing called information streams. Um, but we don't actually know much about uh, how to like make effective information streams, even though we know that there are benefits to them. So they're trying to figure out like whether using information streams built on top of Twitter, they can help um, recommend interesting content to users of Twitter and like what elements of a lead lead to like effective Twitter based recommendations. Okay, so it's, it's about, um, so when you say information streams, I'm thinking, you know, things like the news feeds and whatever, uh, Facebook and whatever the equivalent thing is called in Twitter, right? The stuff you get shown, right? When you open up the website. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And what is the problem with that? There's too much. Okay, so it's a problem of what, filtering? yeah okay and where does their work come in making better ways of filtering and like recommendation systems okay and why do we care about this because we love the internet but there's too much of it so we have to pick <laughs> special parts <laughs> yes we do love the internet they have cats and dogs all right. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Courtney. Anyone else? Any thoughts on the argument or parts of the argument? Anything else that stood out to you? Yeah, Madeline. Um, I think part of their argument is also that, or at least through the related work, also they kind of argue that um, while we know, while the need for recommendations and recommendation systems is long running, and there are many successful examples of it there are three attributes of information streams that make it hard to apply what we already know about recommendation systems to this case. So part uh -huh. of their, their part of their research is um, a, like they're taking the, the, their, yeah, they believe that this is a new, challenge that's not like the other recommendation challenges and that they're offering something that's like cool really okay novel. okay yeah great thank you thank you that's useful uh anything else anyone else okay so like one thank you that, that was all good that was all useful one uh thing that stands out to me when i look at these two papers um, is the difference in the relative amount of prior knowledge about the thing they were studying, right? So if you go back to the open source paper a few minutes ago, you know, it was basically, there's this new thing. We have no idea why it works. We don't know anything about it. Well, we know it has some fundamentally different characteristics that would suggest it shouldn't work at all, yet it seems to work super well. We have no idea why, right? So, you know, very early kind of in a, in a state of knowledge about a particular problem, right? This other one, the second one is what? Is that the same? Is it different? Where does this fit in that, I don't know, timeline? Anyone? Yep. Based on what but, I was able to get through, um, there seems to be a more significant work, at least just not on Twitter specifically, um, about like Facebook messaging to like a lot of Americans. Yeah, that was my impression too. Uh, the comment was, it seemed like there was a lot of prior work here, you know, maybe not in this particular context, but this idea of information streams and filtering and whatnot is something that people have uh, looked at forever. In fact, like, look, I don't know if I can zoom this in. Uh, if, if the first sentence in the related work section is 
recommendations, sorry, recommenders as a solution to attention scarcity have been studied for years. Okay, so this already says that, you know, look, like we're not quite, this is not a new thing, really, right? You know, there's a lot of prior stuff that has happened, right? But there's some particular, you know, niche problem in this space that has not yet been addressed, or there's some potential for some, you know, solutions to be transferred from somewhere else to this new context, this new domain that haven't been explored yet. Um, so he, here's a few things that I, that I pulled out as, as quotes from this that stood out to me when I read this. Um, you know, information streams are inc increasingly popular, um, but with an abundance of information comes the scarcity of attention. There needs to be a way to filter the stream down. You can't possibly absorb all of this. It's, it's more than anyone can observe, uh, absorb. And one approach is to recommend interesting content to users to better direct their attention. So the, you know, to automatically filter this. Um, and you know, again, recommenders in general as a solution have been studied for years in this, in this context of attention scarcity. Um, and you know, perhaps the most well-known approach is this one of collaborative filtering, where you're inferring uh, preference similarity from the overlap of rated items across users. So in other words, you know, if, uh, if your friends all like the particular, I don't know, news feed item, uh, the assumption is that you're also more likely to like the same, uh, I don't know, information piece. Uh, and, you know, therefore that piece of information should get higher priority in this filtering uh, algorithm over other things, right? Based on what uh, was inferred by looking at what your friends uh, read and clicked on and whatnot. Um, okay, but, but these collaborative filter uh, filtering recommenders commonly suffer from a little user rating overlap early on, on the cold start problem uh, and a common solution in this to this cold start problem is to use other sources of information, right? So you don't have yet, you know, if your friends haven't clicked or whatever, read anything yet, you know, they can't make any inferences about that piece of information because you, you know, nobody has clicked on it or read it yet. You know, how would they know if you're uh, gonna like it or not? Uh, and they're saying, you know, may maybe you can still do something useful if you consider other sources of information. Uh, such as the actual content of the items themselves, right? Seems obvious. Um, and, uh, you know, another kind of information is this explicit social information, social processes, whatever. So there's multiple uh, alternative sources of information that could be used for this. Um, okay, and th there comes Twitter. So you're kind of narrowing down this long winded argument by now, like lots of steps in this logical argument. They're narrowing this down is to say, you know, look Twitter, you know, which is the focus of the study has both textual and social information available. So it has all of these ingredients to do these kinds of things. Um, and prior work also suggests that uh, these kinds of recommenders might be applicable to Twitter. Um, however, they haven't been implemented and evaluated on Twitter uh, or information streams in general. And we really just have no idea if they're gonna work in this context. So we have you know, good solid grounding to point us in a potentially good direction, right? We sort of know that these things can be useful. We sort of know a little bit about how we might go about designing them. And we have this new domain where you know, the right ingredients are present, right? That we have access to these kinds of information, we just haven't really been, haven't really implemented or evaluated any of these kinds of algorithms in this new context yet. Okay, so that's kind of the, the core of the argument. Uh, you know, and therefore it is unclear whether these techniques function well, given the differences between their original domains and Twitter, or if some techniques need to be changed to fit the needs of Twitter users better. Okay, so that's all fine. That's the gap. That's what we don't know, right? That they're making that explicit. Right? They're literally saying this, you know. Therefore, it is unclear, blah, 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 right? That's the gap. It's explicit. It's in your face. Um, and then they get you also with you. Who cares about it, right? So uh, 
you know, why should you care about this? Well, you should care about this because, you know, first of all, if you care about Twitter, you should care about this because this informs the design space for Twitter recommender. So, you know, already that's maybe uh, enough of a market right there, but also, you know, it probably informs the design of recommenders for all kinds of other information sites beyond Twitter itself, right? So, you know, you should care if you care about Twitter, but also you should care if you, you know, care about information streams in general beyond Twitter, right? So there's, you know, this clear articulation of why you should care about filling the gap. It's not just that it's unknown and interesting, but also, you know, potentially impactful much beyond the study setting itself, which was already arguably uh, substantial. Okay, so you know, compared to the previous one, much more complex argument, right? So lots of steps they had to, you know, like describe you know, the state of knowledge at various levels, kind of you know, slowly narrow down to this very specific technical problem of combining these, I don't know, sources of information into a recommender system. Um, it took a while to do this, but, you know, once they did this, they had a clear gap in the knowledge and they argued why it's worth filling it. And, you know, it ends there, right? Then, then they go into what they've actually done. So now if you look at these two examples, and I reflect on both, you see arguably these three components and that's the trick. I promised you a trick in today's lecture. This is the trick. Um, it's often referred to as the problem gap hook heuristic to writing a literature review or introduction to a paper. It is super obvious now that you've seen a couple of examples, hopefully, um, and super useful. Like you could probably get away with doing this in every paper you write. Uh, like rarely will you write a different kind of paper where this doesn't really work. I think for most papers, this will always work. Um, and so, you know, remember this, the three components, right? Problem, gap, hook, that's the trick, that's the heuristic. So, you know, spend some time explaining what the problem is, articulate the problem, okay? spend some time articulating what is yet unknown in our understanding of the problem and our thinking about the problem and end with a hook that hooks the reader into wanting to finish reading your paper, you know, beyond the introduction section or whatever related work section, like, like why should they care, right? You know, maybe, you know, may, maybe they just don't find that topic interesting, but you hook them by arguing that is really, you know, important to maybe lots of other people besides yourselves, obviously the authors. Okay, so three ingredients. That's the trick. That's all of today's class. Remember this, right? Three ingredients. This one trick: the problem gap hook heuristic to setting up an argument, um, and this usually applies to say the introduction section or the related work section. Right? If you think of a related work section or a lit review section. You can literally have it consist of these three parts and literally end it, you know, with this gap and hook. Like what is yet unknown? And you know, hopefully that's exactly what your study does, because you're setting yourself up for success. And furthermore, who cares? Okay. So the, the last bit here, the hook bit, is actually pretty important. So I'm gonna go back to you know this thing that I mentioned in the beginning. Well, if I can find my mouse. All right, so that's the bit. It's not just, it's not just, you know, whether you can study something, but also whether, you know, you should, whether anybody but you cares about finding the answer to whatever it is you're studying. All right, so that's, you know, important because like, wh why is this important? Like, why can't we just do, I don't know, hippie science and just do whatever we, I don't know, find interesting. Like wh why, why this, why must it be, I don't know, relevant to more than just you? Money? I mean, essentially, yeah. What, what do you think? Like that thing that drives 
science forward if you're talking about problems that matter to other issues outside of their like narrow particular if you don't connect it to a larger point then you've kind of just done something in isolation yeah i think I'm, i think it's you're both saying the same thing it's sort of pragmatics like there's probably i mean there's not probably there's there's certainly more interesting things that any one person or we all could could do then, then there are uh, people like us, researchers and others, you know, available to do all of these and resources, grad students and whatnot. Um, there's just more interesting things than resources to study them. So uh, pragmatically, you would want to focus on the ones that are likely to have more impact on something, you know, that answer a really important theoretical question or that solve a really important practical problem or you know anything really. But you know, as long as you can argue that it's somehow meaningful and useful to maybe more than just you, uh, who obviously find it most interesting, or your advisor who forces you to work on it because uh, they find it most interesting, even if you don't care about it uh, all that much. But you know, the point is, it has to be relevant to beyond your research group, uh, ideally. Okay, so that's the trick, I think. That's that's more or less the idea. Um, and you know, there's so where's my mouse? There is no mouse. There is a mouse. Okay, so, so back to this. If you remember one trick from today, it's this, right? The problem gap hook heuristic works almost every time. Now, do you think you could apply this? Do you think you can write like this in a concise and but clear way to build an argument like this? Can you do it? I guess we'll see because that's exactly the homework assignment for next week. Yes. Awesome. I think uh, in general, the hardest part is convincing people that you can find things that are using that experience. Yeah. And I think uh, so. The comment was the hardest part is convincing somebody that it's, it's impactful in some way. I agree. And I think we, especially in software engineering, which is my closest community uh, to my work, there's maybe this overemphasis right now on overemphasis as far as I can I, I'm concerned in my opinion um, overemphasis on stuff being immediately practical and immediately actionable and immediately useful you know in industry and, and so on like I think people have lost their patience for I don't know stuff that is interesting and novel and you know, may, maybe it will take longer to make an impact on the world in some way. Uh, and everybody wants stuff that you know, I don't know, companies can use tomorrow or something. But I think I think we're we're exaggerating a bit with this. I, I like to work on I don't know, just general knowledge problems a lot, where you know maybe it takes a while before you can do something practical with that knowledge. Yeah, I feel like. Sort of zoning in on the impact or emphasizing impact is very important in the like, grant proposals and things like that. But for papers and stuff, I think like a technical contribution, even if it may not be like impactful to thousands of developers, because that's you got all very hard to prove. Yep. And yeah, I don't know. I, I, I like technical contributions in papers, like compared to, you know, just like yeah, and I think, I mean, when I say impactful you know, of consequence, I actually, he, even here, I don't mean practical necessarily. I, uh, you know, it could be impactful also, you know, theoretically or, or otherwise. Like, I just, you know, as long as it's somehow, you can argue that it's important in some way, right, to more than just yourself, you know, maybe it's just a really hard theoretical problem that you've solved that will never be practical, right? But maybe it was something that, you know, lots of people have spent lots of time thinking about and you've finally solved it, you know, some mathematical problem or something like this. Um, 
you know, that's totally, you know, important, right? Because like you know, lots of people cared about this for, for a long time. So I, I think, you know, it doesn't have to be industrially practical. That's not what I mean at, at all, but it has to be arguably important in some way, or there, there has to be some vision for it becoming important in some, in some way. So hope, you know, hopefully that, uh, that was clear. Yeah, Elijah? I was just going to add to that point that, like, personally, what I find I do is, like, I stop at the, like, immediate implications of, like, oh, this applies to whatever service I looked at particularly, and I don't, and what reviewers point out and what my advisor points out is you should go further and you need uh -huh. to think about how does this apply to, how could this apply to other things, even if you don't necessarily have direct evidence that it does. Cool. So what did we talk about last class? Say that again. Theory. Theory, right? So that's basically it. I think I think your advisors are, you know, explicitly or implicitly asking you to well, theorize a bit more, like abstract a bit more from your specific findings to you know other contexts where the same conditions hold, where you might expect similar effects. Right. So you know, again, I guess the the one line motto of last. Of the example I gave you of stu student and uh, his um, AI for code generation using natural language, the uh, the motto of that was you know test the theory not the tool. Right, so you know, think about these underlying principles and where else they transfer and apply, you know beyond the specifics of your implementation or flavor of your problem or you know study setting and all, all of that. So I really think we're not doing enough of this. Okay? I think that's really the really important thing to try to do. And I think as a community, we're not doing enough of this. Okay. Um, so just a few so side tricks on uh, things that I find annoying. Uh, and I, you know, obviously you don't want to annoy your instructor uh, but most importantly you don't want to know your advisor uh, or advisors so you know I, I suspect some of these are shared more broadly beyond just me um so you know when you cite things uh, like don't just add citations to pad the bibliography um but rather uh, or you know cite meaningfully and, and to think about uh, about the things you're citing prefer the original source of something uh over secondary sources, you know, oftentimes we cite papers that cite original sources instead of citing the original sources. So, you know, just give credit to the people that actually had the original idea rather than the people that, you know, found the idea useful and used it for something else and mentioned it, in, you know, in their paper. Um, and, you know, try to cite top tier uh, peer reviewed, you know, proper papers over things on archive and whatnot. Uh, oftentimes there are multiple versions of the same paper. It's like, you know, cite the most authoritative one, the one that was published somewhere, you know, in the proper proceedings or journal or what have you. Um, you know, often also, by the way, as an aside, um, aside to the aside, all of these, uh, uh, it's very common to publish preprints or whatever on archive these days. Uh, and often also you do this before the thing gets actually published, wherever it ends up being published. Um, so it's very common for the uh, BibTeX entries you get from Google Scholar, if you're using those to you know, copy paste stuff into your references, it's very common for those to point to the archived version of some paper rather than the one that was published in some you know, official proceedings or journal or, or so, right? Um, so you, you should resist this temptation to annoy your advisor by using the archived version of the citation and instead, you know, go and find where that paper was actually published and, you know, cite the, that, the authoritative source over the preprint. Pre -print. Okay, yeah. And then in terms of like writing, uh, just a few things. Um, so yeah, when you discuss prior work, um, it's very common to be tempted to be very negative about uh, colleagues that 
you know, had the previous state of the art results on whatever thing you improved on. Um, yeah, so, you know, resist that temptation to talk down uh, on them, uh, on their work in your papers, uh, but instead, you know, just objectively, uh, neutrally describe their results and their findings without any value judgments attached to it. So, you know, instead of say Robinson's theory suggests that a cycle of handshaking can be eliminated, but he did not perform experiments to confirm his results. You know, th this is bad because it's a personal attack on this author, right? That's besides the point you're trying to make, it doesn't really add anything to the point you're trying to make. The point you're trying to make is that uh, you know, as yet there is no experimental confirmation for this theory, right, by the original authors or anyone else, right, that's what matters, right, because, you know, presumably that's what you're adding with your paper, right, you know, not that the author specifically is uh, guilty of, of not doing this other thing, you know, and the, and the original paper, right, so try to avoid, you know, personal attacks of, of any sort in this way, um, right, and then when you're Referring to prior work, um, it's nice when you can actually cite the or, or name the authors. So, you know, instead of other work, uh, citation 16, blah, 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 you know, name the authors, right? Uh, Marston 16 did this or this, uh, right? Name the actual uh, authors rather than uh, citing abstractly. Uh, by the way, just as another aside, I don't know if I have this. I see this a lot and it annoys me terribly. So please avoid this at all costs. Um, citations, so for example, I don't know, square bracket 16, uh, citations are not nouns that you can start a sentence with, right? So, you know, uh, 16 has used an approach in which blah, blah, blah. Right? I see this so many times, right? Do not do this. It will annoy me very badly and you don't want you know, to annoy me because you're nice people. You care about my, you know, happiness. Um, okay, so you know, name the authors, for example, and then include the citation uh, after that. Uh, but citations are not nouns; you don't start sentences with them. Um, right, um, and with respect to quoting material from prior work or otherwise, um, uh, if you're quoting it in quotation marks. The expectation is that you include it verbatim, so you can't edit it and also quote it, except in this one case where you, you know, uh, abstract away irrelevant details of that quotation. So this is the only scenario in which it's okay to omit stuff, right? If it doesn't, you know, add to the specific point you're trying to make, but also doesn't mislead, right? So, you know, obviously don't remove stuff that would mislead the reader into drawing a different conclusion after reading that quote. Uh, but it's, you know, it's okay to omit stuff um, if it makes it clear, if it makes it shorter, whatever, you know, uh, whatever it might be. Uh, the rest still has to be verbatim, but you know, don't, uh, don't change the meaning of the quote. Okay. Uh, all right, so that's it. That's what I have for today. Let's see, any thoughts or... Uh, Questions or comments? I will be looking at your use of uh, citations and references in your literature review homeworks at the end of next week. And I will be complaining about, you know, some of these issues that I mentioned and others, I'm sure. Um, now that you mentioned that, is there a way to know what is a top tier venue and what is not? Yes. Um, the short answer is once you know, you know, <laughs> but that's not very useful. I, I recognize this. Um, the other answer is your advisor will tell you you know, which venues in your particular research field are the ones considered the most reputable um, and which ones are less. Uh, so, uh, 
Uh, and the third part of the answer is, I mean, there's various rankings of sorts that, I don't know, uh, rank uh, venues by uh, prestige impact, you know, and, and always in uh, debatable ways. Uh, so you can always refer to some of these, you know, and, and see um, which venues are ranked as the top venues in your particular area. But for example, one such ranking is CS rankings for, for computer science conferences, CS rankings, uh, predefines what are the top conferences in any sub area of computer science uh, and you know names them and you can look them up and you know those are the very top according to the people that I don't know built the ranking right the very top uh, venues in that particular field and you know that's how you know uh, but over time you just you know see them over and over again it's not that many uh, in, in any particular area, not that many venues where people publish. So over time, you'll see them over and over again, and you'll start to recognize that um, you know, they are the ones that uh, tend to have better stuff. Okay. By the way, another bad thing that comes to mind in terms of stuff that will re annoy me, uh, my students know this well, because I always complain about this. Um, you know how you copy paste, so if you're using uh, LaTeX and BibTeX for your papers, you copy paste these BibTeX entries from say Google Scholar and you put them in your paper and you're done and you forget about this. Uh, so, you know, just, just to pick on Luke, because he's here. I feel. Luke uh, had his uh, journal paper uh, accepted, I don't know, the other day uh, and was very excited about it. Uh, and uh, was asked by the publishers to prepare the final ca camera ready version of the paper that includes you know, the one that will appear in the digital library, the, the uh, final version of the paper. Uh, and as part of this, as part of kind of you know, polishing the paper even further beyond uh, the version that was accepted, I've asked Luke to go back and clean up all of the references, which is something I hadn't asked him to do uh, for the original submission. And Luke was very puzzled. He said, what do you mean clean up the references? Like, what could I possibly do to the references to clean them up? They seem just fine. Um, and so this is where, I don't know, my personal obsession, which is probably also shared by some of your uh, advisors, uh, kicks in. So for example, um, if you cite papers published in the same venue, different papers published in the same venue, I expect that all of the mentions of that venue will all be formatted in the same way. Okay, so for example, the proceedings of the International Conference on Software Engineering, you know, probably appear in like five different ways across the, I don't know, 20 references you cite from that venue, right? So I get really annoyed when I see this and I want them all to look exactly the same way because I'm OCD like that. Um, and you know, similar things like you know, the names of the authors is also often overlooked. Like, you know, do you spell the name of the same author in the same way, you know, consistently across all of the places where you cite that author? You know, do they sometimes have a middle initial and sometimes not? You know, these kind of things. Uh, are there typos, etc.? Right. So, um, you know, just as something that gets published in a digital library and lives on the internet forever. I don't know, you want it to look nice, not just to, I don't know, be there. Yeah. I find, so I try to do that in general practice, but I realized that sometimes conferences change their names. So for instance, like the working conference on mining software repository yeah, really became MSR, right? And yep. so I don't know which name to use depending on like the time period, if that makes sense. Yes, great. That's a great comment, right? So this happens a lot. Um, I, I don't know if there's a uh, official answer to this. The, the practice I follow is to uh, use the current name also for the historical previous versions, editions of the same conference. So, you know, it started off as a workshop and then it became a working conference and now it's an international conference. And, you know, I call even the early editions, I call them also international conference because that's the current name. Uh, at the time of writing the paper. I don't know if that's the right uh, way to do it, but it's at least consistent, which is something I find more acceptable. Does, it, does anybody know? I would debate whether that's appropriate because the proceedings are titled based on whatever the conference is called yeah. at that time. So if you're trying to reference it appropriate, I mean, whether it's appropriate or not is up to debate. I don't think there's a correct answer. But I, I would say there's, I would go the opposite direction and use whatever the proceeding title 
was for that. Uh, uh -huh, uh -huh. Interesting. Yeah, great. <laughs> yeah, so I, I don't, I can't really refute this argument because I don't know that mine is correct either. It, it may just be that I like have more more of a background in history, so I want to know exactly whatever the source was called. <laughs> Yeah, so that, that makes sense. Like you could totally, you could totally do that. Um, it will not annoy me. I think it's, but for example, you know, if, if it's sometimes proceedings, sometimes proc, sometimes none of them and just the name of the thing, you know, these are recipes for making me angry. Right? Nobody wants that. And probably your advisors. I, I know of at least some of my faculty colleagues that share uh, some of these views. I don't know how widely shared they are, but certainly some colleagues feel the same way. Have you gotten any such comments from your advisors? Do you have? Yeah, when I wrote my first, or when I was like, writing my first one, I did know to standardize. So. Cool. Well, I suppose you'll get them uh, at some point if you haven't. Maybe from the other people. Okay, anything else? All right, then we end a little early today. I owe you a few minutes anyway from uh, all the time I kept you over in the past. Um, so, discussion post and written lit review homework for next week. Um, and probably a reading assignment, which will be sent later. All right. Thanks all. See you.